After more than 15 years of experience in web development, I honestly believe that Kotlin is probably one of the best general-purpose language you can pick up these days. It's modern without being experimental, it fixes most of Java's pain points without throwing away its ecosystem, and it's just as comfortable for backend services as it is for Android apps or even scripting. But what I like most about it is its simple developer experience. And what's even more exciting is that you can combine it with Ktor to build web applications that are fast, lightweight and actually enjoyable to maintain. If you already have a Java background, you are probably familiar with the powerhouse that Spring has been for decades. And, granted, Spring has first-class Kotlin support these days, but it still carries the architecture and patterns of a framework built fundamentally for Java. Ktor, on the other hand, is maintained by JetBrains, the same company behind Kotlin. As a result, the framework is built from the ground up with Kotlin in mind, therefore, it extends the seamless development experience Kotlin devs are already enjoying. Since Ktor is definitely worth considering, let's take a few minutes to go over what it brings to the table, look at some practical examples, and review some of the best practices required if you decide to build your next project with Kotlin and Ktor. Unlike many web frameworks that throw in every possible feature, whether you need it or not, Ktor is modular by design. You start with a minimal core and only add in the pieces you actually need. What's more exciting is that we get first-class coroutine support out of the box, which means writing a synchronous, non-blocking code feels natural. This makes it straightforward to handle a large number of concurrent requests without introducing unnecessary complexity. Deployment flexibility is another strong point for Ktor. You can run it as a standalone Netty or coroutine-based I.O. server, you can embed it in an existing JVM application or even integrate it into serverless environments without major changes to your code. But where the framework really shines is in its integration with the Kotlin multi-platform. This is something you won't find in traditional backend stacks. If you're building apps that share logic between backend services, Android clients, or even desktop and web, Ktor makes that sharing practical. So you can write shared code for networking, serialization, or even business logic, and reuse it across platforms without duplication. But enough with the theory. Let's look at a practical example. The first thing we'll do is to use the Ktor wizard to generate a new project. The plan is to create a simple REST API to store Pokemons in a database, so we'll add H2 for in-memory storage and the exposed ORM as dependencies. This gives you everything you need to define tables, create data access objects, and perform SQL queries without writing raw SQL. Note that exposed is written in Kotlin exactly for this text stack, so there are no weird APIs or annotations you need to memorize. Next, in the main file, we'll tell Ktor to connect to an in-memory database and we'll initialize our tables in a transaction block. The actual schema can be defined using plain Ktor objects, so let's declare a table with an auto-incrementing integer ID, a name column, a type column, and a level column. We'll also need a data access class, which maps database rows to our Kotlin objects. And, just to get it out of the way, let's also create a DTO that allows us to safely send and receive data as JSON over HTTP. With all the boilerplate code out of the way, we can now work on the actual API. The fun part is that Ktor's routing DSL makes this part feel more like writing Kotlin functions than configuring routes. The most basic path will simply return all entities saved in the database, and thanks to Exposed, we don't have to worry about raw SQL or manual mapping. Note the call object which is an instance of application call, and it's the core object that represents a single HTTP request or response cycle. Every time someone hits your API, Ktor gives you access to the call object inside your route handler. That's how you interact with both the incoming request and the outgoing response. Of course, we can also retrieve a specific entity, and a good practice here is to pass the entity ID as a path variable. To create a Pokemon entry, we read the incoming JSON body into a Pokemon data class instance, and then, inside a transaction, we simply create a new record using the new method. Updating a record works pretty much the same way, except you'll also need to fetch the entity by ID before modifying it. Finally, the delete route will accept a Pokemon ID, which will try to match to an actual entity. If it exists, we delete it and return a 204 no content. If it doesn't, we return a 404 not found. As you can see, this is really straightforward, but we can take things one step further. Most APIs are usually hidden behind some form of authentication, so let's secure our API using JWT. Ktor comes with first-class support for JSON Web Tokens, and setting it up doesn't require any third-party libraries. We just need to define an authentication provider to protect the routes we want to lock down. We'll need an auth strategy with an issuer check and a validate block that ensures that incoming tokens include a username claim. If it's missing, we reject the request. Next, we'll create a simple endpoint to issue tokens. 
Note that in a real-world app, this would involve password checks, database lookups, and hashing. And finally, in order to protect our API, we simply wrap our routes inside an authentication block. So any endpoints defined in here will be secure. In this video, we just scratched the surface of Kotlin development, so let me know in the comments if you are interested in a deep dive. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and until next time, thank you for watching.